Hello and welcome to News Click. Today, in mapping fault lines, we are going to discuss an extremely dangerous moment in international politics in which Israel and Iran are poised for another round of attacks on each other. At the moment, what we have is what your screen shows you that Israel is attacking targets across Iran. This probably went on for about six to eight hours, from night midnight to early morning. And what we have is a picture of Tehran and the kind of the lights that we see are really missiles hitting each other, which means Iran's anti-missile shield, at least holding partially. Now, what is the effect of this barrage that has taken place? We don't know as yet, but Israel claims to have hit manufacturing uh, organizations, facilities in Iran, as well as places from which missiles or anti-missiles could be launched. So they claim to have attacked that. But what is important is that there are still some red lines that they have followed. They have not attacked nuclear facilities and they have not attacked oil, energy, gas facilities in Iran, which would have led to a much larger, uh, perhaps, counterattack by Iran. So at the moment, there was an attack by Iran earlier, which was in response to both its attack on its uh, embassy in Syria, as well as the assassination of Ismail Hadiye in uh, Iran, in Tehran. And following that, of course, the attack on the Hezbollah headquarters killing uh, Nasrullah. So if we take all of this account into account, what we have is blows, counter blows, which are taking place. At the moment, it's not relevant who fired the first shot, but what is relevant is Israel is engaged in multiple attacks on different countries, as we'll see as we progress in this discussion. Now, we already know the attack on Gaza, which continues, attack on West Bank, which continues, as well as attack on Lebanon, which continues. But this has taken it to a different pitch because Iran has a huge number of missiles which it can, it can fire. And about a month back, they had done a token attack on Israel to show that it can penetrate its, basically, its missile defense and hit sensitive targets in Israel. It had warned, it seems, it had it at least told the United States that it is going to do this and therefore, Israel had about two hours preparation time that aircraft probably were in the skies and they had not been, therefore they were not hit. So while all this is going on, let's look, take a look at the larger picture. This is the larger picture of the region. In order for Israel, which is here, to attack, this is where Israel is located, to attack Iran, it has to essentially overfly overfly Syria in Iraq. Now, how much did it do so? They could also attack, conceivably, they could also attack by crossing Jordan and then over Iraq. Now, which route they followed, we do not know as yet, but it is clear that there are multiple ways of attacking Iran. Of course, I don't think they went down the Red Sea and then went around the Arabian Sea to attack Iran. It seems they would have taken this route now, what they would have done probably is go from the airfields either in Israel or in Cyprus and then fire the missiles from either Syrian or Iraqi airspace, not entering Iran directly or fire even from a longer distance over the ocean itself. Probably they did come into Syrian airspace probably also into Iraq airspace in order to attack Iran. But they did not probably enter Iran's airspace because they would not like to get hit by Iranian and missiles fired at them. So outside their airspace, but definitely the missiles entered Iran and hit their targets. Now, 
why these targets were hit, of course, would seem to indicate that they have followed a certain degree of care in seeing that certain red lines are not crossed the way Iran had also not crossed certain, basically the red lines. Because if they had, for instance, attacked the Dimona nuclear facility, they had attacked the fertilizer plant near Tel Aviv, I think the war would have spun out of control. Just as Iran observed some red lines, it appears not hitting nuclear facilities, not, not hitting essentially the oil and energy facilities, they have also observed some red lines. How effective was the air defense? How effective was the missile volley that Israel has fired is a question. And some of the commentators have claimed that this was really a token attack. It was not a serious attack. Others have said that it was. It has shown that Iran's anti-missile defense shield can be penetrated. Now, we are going to leave this for future because this is still early days, early day as yet to analyze what has really happened. But it is clear that Iran's anti-missiles did work because we saw in the previous picture that the lights over uh, Tehran, which is really missiles hitting, anti-missiles hitting missiles is an indication that Tehran's defense held partially. Whether it was penetrated, whether all the missiles were stopped, is a question that we don't have answers as yet, but it does probably mean that some facilities were hit because two soldiers, Iran has said, were killed. So effectively, certain missiles did get through. And that is the picture that we have. We'll continue to follow these developments as we go along. And we do think this is a very important uh, step that has been taken. Whether it will stop here, it will go further, we have to see. Here, it's also interesting to know Two other things that happened in this context. One is, few days back, US Department, Defense Department, somebody seemed to have leaked the information of what Israel's game plan was in the missile strike. And of course, then they would have been forced to modify it. The fact that this leak is there would seem to show either the United States wanted to warn Iran or there are forces in the US State Department which is not happy with the road with the road that Israel is following. Question mark for us. Do we know the answers? No, not as yet. Will we know in future? Wait, need to see what happens in the future. So this is the picture as far as the attacks are concerned. The other important point which we'd like to point out, we'd like to take up here, is that just few weeks before this attack, United States has given what are called hard anti-aircraft, anti-missile shield, artillery, whatever you want to call it, missile defense. A battery was given to Israel and it means that 100 US soldiers are operating the battery in Israel. So if Iran today attacks Israel, there is a possibility it would like to take down that, take out the third anti-aircraft battery shield, anti-aircraft, anti-missile battery shield that the United States has provided, which means a dangerous escalation again, because United States soldiers are operating that, not the Israeli soldiers. So this is where we are po poised at the moment, dangerous times, but yet certain red lines are still being observed. Whether it can be observed forever, we don't know. Because if you remember the first world war, nobody wanted a world war. But in the progression of things that happened, finally, both sides entered into a war, which really was perhaps the most, uh, na highest toll in number of people killed during wars. And that still remains as an example that you may think there are red lines which people will not cross, but in an escalatory battle like this, when both sides are willing to escalate, we do not know where countries will end up. But it is very clear that Israel is now fighting a multiple front battle in the area. If we look at the picture, and here is again Israel that the blue is Israel. You have Jordan, you have Lebanon, 
you have Iraq, and of course, you have Iran. So these are the countries in close proximity with Israel. If we take this, these countries into account, you have Israel here. You have, of course, Palestine, where the battle is taking place. You have Lebanon. You have Iraq. You have Syria. Jordan is still neutral, but Israel, of course, is in under occupying Palestine. That's something which the United Nations also accepts, that it's a, it's a country which is under occupation. So you have Palestine under occupation. It has at the moment attacked Lebanon. It has been bombing it, firing missiles at it. It has also attacked Syria. It has attacked Iria, Iraq. And now you have Iran as well and under attack. So as you can, you can see that there is already that Israel is in a multi-front battle in the area. And its hope is by keeping this battle on, it can really destroy the opposition against it. It can destroy Hezbollah and Lebanon. It hopes that in Syria, that Assad government will be defanged. It hopes that its opposition in Iraq would also lead to a change in Iraq itself. And of course, it hopes that Iran can be at least neutralized militarily by the fear of an engagement with Israel. So this is where Israel is. It is on a multi-pronged battle in the region. And at the moment, we are not taking up why it is in such a multi-pronged battle. But we're just talking of what's happening. The interesting issue is today that Saudi Arabia, Jordan, as well as other countries like Kuwaitis, you have the United Arab Emirates, all of these countries, Bahrain, Qatar, all these countries, Oman, they are sort of sitting out of this. They are not involved in this battle. And they have said that we will not allow our territory to be used in an attack on Iran. Now, last time when Iran launched its missiles, it's true that Jordan participated in taking out the missiles. And they have been more or less in alliance with Israel. So the real battle is Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. Those are the parties who have been fighting against Israel or source forces within these countries which are fighting against Israel. So let's start with Lebanon as the first big, shall we say, battlefield that we are seeing. In this picture, we have a closer look at the immediate battlefields which are there. One is, of course, as we all know, Gaza. We'll come back to Gaza. There is, this is Lebanon. And of course, parts of Syria. Now, this is the immediate battlefield we see. And in this, of course, Gaza is the biggest victim. We'd all know. We'll have a look at what has happening in Gaza. But let's have a look at first at Lebanon, where a huge battle is taking place. And here, unlike Gaza, Israel seems to be taking quite a number of hits in terms of people killed, soldiers killed, missile attacks from Lebanon continuing, their inability to stop these missile attacks. And therefore, the north part of Israel, which is where the problem lies for them, this is an area where they are seeing, where is the, the north side of the border. This is north of the border, this is south of the border. North of the border, they are trying to get their forces in. And the, basically, the north of Israel is under attack by missiles which have been fired. Losses that Lebanon is suffering, the Hezbollah is suffering north of the border. But north of Israel, which is really south of the border, we are seeing essentially in this particular area, the region still seems to be under fire control of the Hezbollah. And Israeli so population has been 
forced to vacate that area. 60,000 people, 70,000 people have vacated the area and that still continues. So in some sense, stalemate over this. Militarily, yes, some progress by in which Israeli forces have entered Lebanon, but the penetration doesn't seem to be have gone very far. Attacks on Beirut has increased, civilian casualties in large numbers, but the war over there, in, in this particularly in this region of Lebanon and Israel, it seems there is a military stalemate or if there is an advance by Israeli forces, it's not a significant advance. This is a close picture of what we are talking about. Here is Beirut and here is the area where significant attacks are taking place on both sides. But as you can see, much larger of attacks have taken place by Israel on Lebanon and on Hezbollah forces. But this is also an area where there are United Nations forces deployed for ceasefire and those UN posts have been attacked, particularly close to the Syrian side. United Nations forces have been attacked, peacekeepers, and they're largely Irish peacekeepers who have been attacked, and some of them have been injured in these attacks. But what is interesting is, though Israel has claimed that they're in a defensive battle against Hezbollah, the picture, and this picture we have seen earlier also, is that much more shelling attacks, missiles have been launched by Israel on Lebanon than vice versa. What is also very important is what's happening in Beirut. Beirut, heavily, densely populated, repeatedly missile attacks have taken place. Bombs which are not supposed to be used in civilian areas, densely populated civilian areas have been used. For instance, when Hezbollah chief now Hassan Nasrullah was killed, the bombs that were launched were what are called basically bunker buster bombs, very large. And effectively what they do is destroy buildings and people in it. And 300 civilians died on that attack that on that day alone. In one, one particular attack which was launched to eliminate the Hezbollah, Hezbollah chief Nasrullah. So given that, those kind of attacks still continue, all in the name of that they somehow are Hezbollah related. But what we are seeing is large scale destruction of civilian areas, civilian population, and large numbers of people killed. As of today, figures, of course, this is going to change every day. We have 2,570 civilians killed in Lebanon. This is far higher than the number of people that have been killed, for example, in Israel. So this would seem to indicate that at the moment that certain limits are being crossed and the ones crossing it clearly are the Israelis who have decided that they will beat the Lebanese popul population to submission with the threat that if Hezbollah continues to operate from Lebanon, then all of Lebanon stands at the risk of being destroyed, slaughtered, people being slaughtered, economic huge attack on their economy. All of this is what we are seeing at the moment in Lebanon. So this is the picture of one part of the battlefield. Next, we'll go to Gaza. We'll start with one very poignant picture that we have, which is the World Health Organization now says that it has lost contact with what is called the Kamal, Kamal Adwan Hospital which is in northern Gaza. Now, this was the last remaining hospital which was functioning in Ga northern Gaza, uh, north of the Nezirim corridor, which we'll examine this a little later. And this now has also essentially been, it has essentially stopped functioning and its doctors, we don't know what's happened to them. We don't know what's happened to the medical staff. We do know that some of the hospital inmates, particularly those in uh, intensive care units have already died and more are going to die because now it has a 100 bed hospital. It is catering to many more people than that, but it has no medicine, it has no electricity and its medical staff have been removed. They have been actually taken away and this means that the 
essentially the inmates of the hospital. It's the only hospital functioning in north of Gaza, 400,000 people. That effectively has been shut down. This is the picture of how the director of the hospital was arrested and so were the rest of the people. The women, we do not know whether the women uh, hospital staff, what's happened to them, but we do know that the men seems to have been separated and they were taken away, what is called for questioning. This is the United Nations Secretary General. He himself has said that this is, we are unable to reach the hospital currently. We've lost touch with the personnel there and it's deeply disturbing because of the number of people that were being served and were sheltering there. So this is the United Nations Secretary General talking about a hospital which is being run by WHO. This is the larger picture of what's happening in northern Gaza. We'll go into the details of what we, uh, information we have. At least 38 people have been killed as of yesterday in Gaza's Khan Yunus, which is only one area in northern Gaza due to the kind of bombardment that took place. If you look at the picture that is there, it would seem to show that most of Khan Yunus is destroyed. And we'll have more details of that, what the United Nations is talking about, the kind of destruction that's happening over there and the kind of starvation, malnutrition and danger of disease particularly among the young children that is being seen over there. So we'll come to that. Now here is again continuation of what kind of attacks are taking place. But here is also another interesting fact. The three journalists who are in southern Lebanon, who are in a particular place which they were sheltering in, in a camp, they have also been killed. So at the moment you have indiscriminate attacks both on Khan, Northern Gaza, Khan Yunus being an example of that, but also on journalists, both in Gaza and in Lebanon. This is Northern Gaza. Here is what's called the Netzarim Corridor. This is the corridor. And this Northern Gaza, is, which is about 400,000 people, Israel has said the entire North Gaza has to be vacated. How the people will go to other areas, we had discussed Khan Yunus. Khan Yunus is here. How the people will go there is not Israel Sadek, but they have said the whole must be vacated. And this corridor, the Netzarim corridor that we talked about, this particular corridor is under Israel's military control. So it's cut off from the rest of Gaza, 400,000 people and they are supposed to, supposed to vacate it, leave everything behind. So what is it, in fact, is the attempt to squeeze the 1.9 million, 2.1 million population that is there in Gaza to about maybe 60, 70 percent of the space and completely take away one part of Gaza, which is the northern part where they have really created a corridor, military corridor, which they are occupying. By the way, this happened after 7th October last year. This was not under Israel's military control. This is what they have done. And their plan, obviously, is to vacate this whole area and set up Israeli settlements over there, as they are doing in the Palestinian West Bank. So this seems to be the basic immediate picture that they have. Let's look at the Gaza picture itself. Gaza Strip, this is United Nations figures, they are relief organizations figures. It now shows that 90% of the population, 86% is what it says, are in conditions which are really stressed. That means malnutrition, high malnutrition. And this is something which has worsened over the months. You must have seen the picture we have done earlier. The Today, about 90%, 86% is a figure, is now under conditions where they are in what is called IPC phase three and above, which means near starvation. So this is the picture, <clears throat> 60,000 cases of acute mal malnutrition amongst children aged six to 59 months. 
So the set, the children, of course, were get worse affected. Sixty thousand children face acute malnutrition. So these are the figures for Gaza, which are just broad figures. We are not talking about the deaths which are happening because of attacks over there. But there is no question that this this picture shows that we are towards heading towards a catastrophe in Gaza. And with 2.14 billion people, what it says is 86% of the people are in conditions which is severe or emergency conditions. Now that is the picture we have before you. And it just shows that things are slowly getting even worse. And Israel's intention seems to be that force people out. If you can force 400,000 people out, another section will tomorrow be attacked. And again, the attempt will be to force them out. How will they get pushed out? Pushed out into Egypt or exterminated? This seems to be the two objectives that the Netanyahu government has in Israel. The question that we have before us, and we're not going to go into details on this one today. The question before us is why does the United States effectively give a carte blanche to Israel to do what it is doing in Gaza. It's also clear that without United States support, Israel cannot do what it is doing. It doesn't have the money, it doesn't have the weapons, it doesn't have the missiles, it doesn't have the cover that the United States is providing it, and it doesn't have the US and the Western media backing it up, giving it a virtual carte blanche in whatever it does calling any attack or criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic, while it's very clear that what Israel is doing is partial genocide in Gaza at the moment, if not something worse. So given that, why is it so? And we have Responsible Statecraft is an American news platform. And their argument is that one of the major reasons why US is supporting wholeheartedly what Israel is doing, because it means huge benefits to the arms industry in the United States. US people may be bankrolling whatever ammunition, whatever missiles, whatever guns, etc. that is being supplied by the United States. But the beneficiary is not the United States, it's not Israel, the beneficiary is the US arms industry. And that is why they have a solid backing among the political parties, as well as among the media organizations who are quite happy to follow whatever the arms industry in the United States is willing to tell them. This is what Eisenhower had said long back. A military industrial complex is taking over the United States. Of course, he said it when he was leaving his presidency, not when he had entered it or not in the middle of his presidency, only when he was entering it. And what we see seems to be a complete takeover of the United States, both its, military, both its civilian political leadership as well as its media. Because all we read in the US press, and the Western press, is Iran-backed Hezbollah, Iran-backed so-and-so. It's all about Iran, and Israel is apparently only reacting to all attacks on it, while the basic point is for forgotten that Israel is in occupation of Palestine, both of the West Bank and of Gaza, and both of these are illegal according to international law. In fact, any liberation efforts, any struggle that the people of occupied territories do is in fact legal kind of attacks that is being say, seen is illegal even in war, let alone by the occupying force, which is what Israel today is. And why is it an occupying force? Is it because I'm saying so? No, this is United Nations which has said it time and again that Israel is an occupation of Palestine to Palestine territories, illegal occupation of it, and even the move in the International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, to designate what Israel is doing as war crimes hasn't stopped Israel because it is the backing of the United States, it's the backing of the Western countries, and that is the problem that we have. And we need to analyze why are these countries willing 
to support Israel in what it is doing. And the answer, which we'll discuss another day, is really their own colonial past and their whole belief in the superiority of certain races over others, racism, eugenics, colonialism, their history of all of this is perhaps the reason that they still believe that West Asia, the region as a whole, can be controlled by arming Israel to control the region. And that seems to be why that countries like United Kingdom, France, Germany, other countries in Europe are willing also to fall behind the United States in completely backing what Israel is doing, both against the Palestinians and in the neighborhood. Thank you very much. This is all today we have today for our discussion on mapping fault lines. We'll be with you every week with more episodes of Fault Lines.